Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alex Poole, and I'm an assistant professor at the College of Computing and Informatics at Drexel University. Today, I'm honored to host the fourth in our MSI webinar series, which will feature Dr. Matt Kelly. Dr. Kelly is an assistant professor at Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics. He earned his bachelor's degree in computer science at the University of Florida. Subsequently, he earned his master's and his PhD in that same subject at Old Dominion University. Dr. Kelly's research areas include web archiving, privacy, and information visualization. What is more, his teaching areas include web programming, systems, and architecture. He brings a technical archival perspective to Drexel CCI's new MSI degree, particularly the digital content management major. He will teach courses in enterprise content management and data curation, among others. Dr. Kelly has received multiple awards for his research. For instance, he has received an Innovation Award from the Library of Congress and the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, a fellowship from the NASA Virginia Space Grant Consortium, and a number of best paper awards and nominations from conferences in the digital libraries field. His presentation this afternoon will provide a high level summary of outstanding issues surfaced in the field of web archiving that he explored in his recently completed dissertation. It is an honor and privilege to introduce to you today, Dr. Matt Kelly. Oh, thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, today, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but we um, hopefully if you're hearing this and you're on the right channel for Zoom. Um, today, I'm going to be giving my presentation, uh, Save My Web Things for Me and Others, but Not All. Um, it is sort of an extension of my dissertation and where I'm going with my research. Uh, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Drexel's uh, DCM major. Uh, <coughs> um, so uh, we, uh, we are starting a, a master's in information science degree uh, here at, um, at Drexel. And um, to obtain the degree, you have three foundation courses, uh, five core courses, uh, six select uh, six electives and uh, capstone. Um, some of these courses are, for example, information visualization, uh, enterprise content management, which I'll be teaching this spring, and then applied ontology. Um, and hopefully that uh, through this presentation will encourage you to put your application in for a master's degree at Drexel. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get on to the presentation. Uh, first, as you're probably familiar with the web where you see um, sites like uh, the Drexel homepage on the left here, um, your Facebook page or your photos that you keep of your child online. And we put the information on the web and sort of expect it to be there. We go back the next day and assume that it will be there. Um, but sometimes these services go under or aren't accessible um, and we no longer have to access that information. If we uh, believe that information has value, then we want to preserve it in some way. So for example, if we put, if we talk to our cousins on Facebook and we want to uh, revisit those conversations, if we don't have, aren't able to access Facebook, then for example, we cannot uh, access that information anymore. Um, so there are efforts to preserve the web. Uh, the Inner Archive, for instance, as one set of web archive, uh, you allows, uh, uh, has, has efforts to try to preserve content. And you'd see things, for example, the Facebook homepage on the right there, which may not be exactly what you would expect from uh, the Inner Archive, but they preserve things like CNN and publicly accessible pages. So what you would expect for uh, to be preserved is uh, your own content, your own Facebook. You want to revisit the conversations with your cousin and without um, having someone preserving it somewhere, um, the efforts from Inner Archive don't really help you in that regard. So that's sort of one of the focuses of uh, my research is uh, preservation of content that um, the uh, institutional web archives may not necessarily preserve. Um, so beyond Inner Archive, there are other efforts uh, with different scopes. For, for instance, uh, the UA UK web archive only preserves things within the UK domain or of the country's interest. Um, things like if you see in the, the red icon in the middle is the Icelandic Web Archive, similar situation, or there's services online that allow you to submit a URI to it for like archive.today or a web citation that allow you to tell it what you want to archive and it will do a one-off preservation of that. But a lot of these services still will only get things that are publicly accessible. Um, so the things like your Facebook feed or if you wanted to revisit your bank accounts or your baby photos or niche sites or corporate internet sites, anything really that isn't on the surface web and is not publicly accessible um, is not preserved for the future and less use of, for the individual. Um, but it's probably a good thing that they don't have that. You wouldn't necessarily want uh, others to see your own, uh, your own photos or your own Facebook feeds or your conversations or your bank ledgers or content that has uh, ramifications if it were to be preserved and subsequently are uh, publicly accessible. 
Um, so to talk a little bit about what web archives are with respect to the live web, um, we have this co context, if you see on some of the right, uh, sorry, all four of the images on the right are captures of, uh, of some uh, part of the web related to Drexel in the past, but we don't necessarily have context. What you or I are they of? Um, when were they captured? Um, and we kind of want to have a way for these websites to say, this is what I am, this is when I am, so we can relate it back to um, the present web of what we see here. So if we want to uh, experience the past, we need to know uh, what it is of the past that we're, uh, that is the basis of our experience. Um, so we want to be able to say, what did Drexel.edu look like in the past? And for example, a query to inner archive will tell us this is what it looked like in 2019, this is what it looked like in 2012, et cetera, down all the way as far as they have captures. So the Memento framework is a uh, standard way to express these syntax and semantics, where these um, captures, the individual captures, what we call mementos, can say, this is what I am of. So if you see in the three different figures there are captures of the CCI homepage in the past in March of 2016, February of 2020, and uh, March of 2014, whereas the one on the bottom right is at the Drexel homepage in August of 2007. So we have a way to associate the three images of the Drexel CCI homepage with each other in the past, and then we have a completely separate timeline of the Drexel homepage in the past. Um, so having this sort of association gives us context as to what we're viewing uh, relative to what we can currently see in the present. And Memento supplies that. So web archiving, at least two of the components that we'll talk about here are the preservation aspect and the access aspect. So the preservation uh, entails mainly taking what you see on the live web um, at this time, the now, uh, and being able to experience it in the future. So to do so, you basically have to capture it and ensure that you can uh, access it the subsequently. And so the access component of web archiving is a completely different animal where you need to be able to associate what you captured with what it was. And though we have the syntax and semantics through Memento, the dynamics of doing so are still pretty complicated. So with regard to preservation, you basically have to capture what you see and make it um, be able to be re-experienced. So you see an HTML page is out of URI because we need context of what it was. Um, in that HTML page, there are many things like embedded images, um, JavaScript uh, script files that um, incorporate behavior into the web page. Um, and within those files, there may be um, recursively embedded images. So for example, if a JavaScript uh, file includes another embedded image or another uh, JavaScript, then you sort of have to trace it down until you, you uh, get everything that you have that you can uh, assure yourself that in the future, you'll be able to have everything in the home page, um, sorry, everything in the web page to be able to uh, experience it exactly how it was. Um, so all these uh, different resources on the web are preserved into a format called work. It's an ISO standard that basically allows you to take a trace of everything that you experienced um, and store it into one separate file. So if you see on the right side, we have sort of some metadata about what this actually is. This represents uh, a certain URI in the live web. Um, and then it also records the um, HTTP headers that aren't usually exposed to you uh, when you're viewing the web with a web browser. And that makes it so um, re-experiencing that same page uh, allows the browsers of today to experience it as, as it was. So for example, we know that we got an HTTP 200 OK or a redirect or um, what the content was, what the content type was, a language, that sort of thing. Uh, by recording that information down, we can experience it as exactly as it was. And of course, on the bottom, we have the payload. So in this case, the HTML of a web page, which has um, the references to um, other resources um, like the style sheet, the CSS file there or the, um, another image that you can then trace down for preservation. So it's important to recognize that this work format is sort of a record, a concatenated record of records of all the um, different uh, resources that are required to re-experience the web page in whole. Um, so the other component of this is the access. So once, after you have this kind of stuff, you need to re be able to rebuild the web page. So you have to be able to, your browser has to be able to say, I got this HTML and I need to be able to look up back into the archive instead of going to the live web to see the images that are embedded in the page or the job scripts that are embedded in the page. So we don't want the web pages of the past to reach into the live web to uh, get the resources to rebuild the experience. Otherwise, it's not an accurate um, uh, uh, record of what the past was, but rather sort of a hybrid. And that's not what we want for the sake of preservation. So accessing these are usually accomplished through web browsers. So for instance, we have two different web archives here, the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, which many are familiar with, 
um, and um, archive.today, which uh, is represented at many different domains. So here it's archive.ph, but it's also archive.is and many other different um, hosts that allow it to be a little more resilient in time as their, um, uh, as their domains expire or are seized. Um, and so it's important to realize also here that um, URIs are opaque. So if you look at the top example of uh, Internet Archive, you may try to infer that this capture was uh, done on uh, March 19th of 2013. Um, but from the second example here with archive.ph, you'll see that those sort of semantics can't be inferred and they rightfully can't be inferred because URIs are opaque. You're, you aren't supposed to try to figure out what something represents based on the URI alone. So if it's something.jpg, it may not necessarily be, be a, a JPEG when you dereference it. And this is sort of one of the axioms of, uh, of the web is you need to dereference the actual um, URI itself to see what sort of content it is there. So Memento um, uh, mitigates this by um, introducing some headers, which we won't necessarily go into detail here, um, but it makes it where you can express this in a very uh, semantic way. You can say this capture at this URI represents this uh, live web URI at this specific time. Um, so kind of backtracking this, um, the topic of this talk is to um, save my things, save my web things for me and others, but not all. So as you see the examples in the top, um, though uh, web archives will preserve things at facebook.com or bankofamerica.com, what you would get on the top here are simply the login pages. You wouldn't get the content that you really care about. So you gotta ask yourself, is it really preserved uh, to the extent you want it to be? So we want to sort of capture this content behind authentication. So we want to see, to be able to re-experience the part of the web that we did um, from the live web uh, through representations like we see on the bottom, our Facebook feed, our bank accounts, our actual photos and not login pages. So some of our initial work um, uh, strove to uh, overcome this issue. Um, and part of this comes down to uh, preservation by reference versus by value. So when you're preserving content on a live web, you say, do it, uh, preserve it at, uh, from this place, so cnn.com. Um, but if you say facebook.com, you end up getting login page. So um, being able to do this by reference preservation is insufficient to get the representation that we would expect from preservation uh, tools. And so we have this concept of preservation by value of preserving what we see in, in the web browser itself to be able to capture that and re-experience that because that's a part of the web that we, um, we, uh, we see on, uh, on the web. So this uh, part of this work was funded by um, the NEH um, Archive What I See Now um, project. Um, and as you'll see in the bottom, the, what you would experience, it would be more of what's on the right, what you see on there within your own captures and not necessarily um, expecting to get uh, the right and then ending up getting the left. Um, so one of the downsides of this is if you're capturing content behind authentication, um, the same um, ability to authenticate into sites uh, no longer exists. And so you can't go to a web page of a capture you saw in the past and expect it to hit the Facebook authentication mechanism to be able to replay it. All of that is going on. You're preserving the representation as it was, um, and that's it. And that's um, there's a little bit of an issue on that because if you uh, do so and you want to share those captures and they're available at a publicly available URI despite you preserving them from behind authentication, then, um, then you might have information leakage of your personal information or sensitive information of things you want to preserve uh, for the future, um, but you may not want others to experience in the past. So that's the concept of save my things for me and others, but not all. We don't want everyone to be able to see it. We want to be able to save it and share it with who we like, um, but not necessarily with everyone. Um, so we'll uh, dig into that a little more in this uh, conversation. For example, here, you know, if Alice says, check out my capture of, at my archive of facebook.com, um, Carol here may say, hey, that, uh, that contains some information that, uh, well, first you may, you may not own, so information about Carol's personal life that she doesn't want shared, but also sensitive information about Alice that uh, she may not want to um, want the public to know about, but she still wants to see for herself. So you also have this concept um, in Memento of time map. So a time map is a way to associate uh, how uh, pages in the past existed uh, and how they do, uh, uh, how, how they will in the future. So if we have different, uh, different URIs in the past, so for example, um, CNN may ex have existed at cnn.com on the secure 
uh, scheme or www.cnn.com or with a port or index.php or any of these different variants, we have this concept of um, canonicalization that allows these different URI variants to be coalesced. So when we see, uh, when we query archives for cnn.com, we are able to get all these references and coalesce them together and view how it was in the past, despite the different um, uh, variations of the URI. So this, this uh, is important to note when you have, uh, when you're um, combining facebook.com in the past and uh, in, the, in the present, if you're going in the past with facebook.com and you see login pages and then you see your own content, there's sort of this differential between um, the past and the present that um, doesn't really parallel between the two. Um, so for example, for cnn.com, that would be useful to know all these different permutations uh, and be able to associate them together some time maps allow it. So as we see as an example uh, of a Memento time map here, uh, we have the context of the original URI, which Memento calls the URI R of cnn.com. And then we have uh, multiple different archives that are aggregated together in um, their uh, identifier shown. So you see here one from the Inner Archives Wayback Machine. We see one from the Portuguese Web Archive. Uh, we see one from the Icelandic Web Archive and one from Archive. And there could be many others, but we get the context of uh, where we need to go to access this capture of a uh, live, live web URI in the past, what that live web URI is, the URI R here as expressed at the top, and then the, um, uh, a temporal indicator, a date of what this actually represents. And so all of this is provided by the Mento framework, which introduces the concept of time on the web. Um, so this concept of Mento aggregation um, is essentially a software tool that allows you to uh, query uh, an endpoint on the web and say, give me everything you have for this URI, and it will do the task of um, querying all these different URI, these different web archives, um, aggregating them together, temporarily sorting them, um, and providing them back to the user. So this concept of mental aggregation is important because if there is a page that changes very rapidly or very slowly in time, um, your uh, accuracy of the picture of the past of that URI uh, will be reflected by the granularity of um, how many captures there were. So the more archives you have, the less likely it is that you'll have temporal holes and you'll get the whole picture of a site in the past. Um, so you've got to ask who runs these aggregators, who controls who, what these, uh, the narrative of, this, of the story of what the page in the past. So normally up until a few years ago, um, the Memento aggregator was, the Memento web uh, aggregator was hosted at Los, Alamo, Los Alamos National Laboratory. So you would send a uh, query to this address as you see in the top here, and um, you would give back a set of archives that they aggregate together. Um, this set of archives isn't changeable, so what you get, you get, and you're glad that you got it. Um, but if you uh, want to include an additional uh, archive in that set, or a new one comes about, or um, there's one that's been decommissioned, you don't have any control from the perspective of user as to what um, archives you use as a basis for that story in the past. So um, in order for new archives to be included from this aggregator, they have to first be me memento compliance that requires someone to reach out and say, hey, make your archive memento compliance. So all the archives that you've seen so far in this are, and they have come about because of the cooperation of the memento team, um, but also someone has to manually add that archive into the configuration of the, um, of the aggregator, which is hosted on a server somewhere. Um, and so doing so is, um, uh, makes it where it's very hard to include new sources into the story or decommission old sources um, from the perspective of user. You're basically at the mercy of someone that's running a web service. Um, and you can also, if you have captures of the past of your own Facebook stuff or just simply public captures of the live web, your captures will never be included in that story. So things that are very niche to your uh, interest um, may not be represented in web archives because they reside in your machine and they are in aggregated into the story of the past. So sort of um, uh, breaking apart some of the, uh, the time maps here, we have the original URI, which we saw before, as well as reference to other time maps, which are just simply listings of it. Um, we have the context of the URI. The URI M here is the brown part here that um, says this is where you go to get it. And then the temporal date stamp, as well as a way to do um, temporal negotiation, which we won't necessarily discuss in this. Um, but Memento uh, allows you to do, uh, if you say you want to capture, for example, from 2014 and only uh, archives have captures from 2013, it will do its best to, um, through temporal negotiation, to resolve it to that capture that is the closest to your time. But that's beyond the scope of this, uh, this talk. And you can explore more through the uh, Memento standard. Um, so this issue of having a remote aggregator um, uh, that the user can't control is, uh, is something that um, wasn't necessarily a, a good thing from the open source perspective. So we wanted to be able to, to include our own caption here and tell our own narrative and, and include the 
websites of the past that we care about or those uh, captures behind authentication we have. Um, so some of the work of uh, Alama Nelson at ODU, Old Dominion University, uh, programmed a, their own aggregator that allows individuals to deploy their own service and it's self-contained, doesn't require any configuration on your machine, um, compile it to many different platforms, open source, so you can search the logic. Um, but the power in this is also, as someone that runs their own aggregator, you choose what the sources are that are aggregated in the picture. So if you want to include or decommission some archive in the set of archives that are used for the storytelling, you can do so and fairly easily. Um, so you're still setting up a web service and um, which is uh, one that you control and it could be on your machine and you can create it all the same. Um, and if you don't want to specify a custom set, you, if the uh, aggregator at Los Alamos happens to go down and you still want to use this functionality, you have the ability to do so through a service that's running on your own machine. Um, and so uh, through further work of this, we sought to give a little more power to the clients uh, in this regard for memento aggregation. So through uh, some of my previous work in a framework for aggregating private and public web archives, we, inter we extended onto Memgator, the open source memento aggregator that allows you to uh, more systematically aggregate with captures from private web archives, as well as allow not just the person that's running the web archive, but the clients themselves, those that are querying the aggregator to uh, set which set of archives are aggregated. And that's really powerful because um, if you have a specific set of archives and you le learn about a new one, you can inform an aggregator that I have this other set, be able to share this set, and then collectively um, aggregate the, uh, the different sources for the story you want to show in the past. Um, we also introduced a way to um, regulate uh, authentication and access uh, through a separate um, entity here that we call the Private Web Archive Adapter. We'll talk about these a little more. And then a way to do archive and negotiating dimensions beyond time which is um, a really powerful component that's still kind of a loose end in this research that um, we're going to explore some more. So I'm gonna dig into these a little bit um, and talk about how it's relevant to the point of this presentation. So first, the Memento Meta Aggregator um, was an extension of Memgator that allowed you to um, have, oh, and there's a citation there that I should have added in there, um, that allows you to have uh, deploy aggregators on your, own, uh, on your own machine, empowers the client to specify not just their own set of archives, but also through our extensions in, uh, in my previous work to specify things like precedence. So for example, if you, want to, uh, if you want to look to certain sets of archives, your own archives, or really any sort of uh, parameter for querying, you can do so through the syntax introduced in the framework uh, in, on the previous slide. And you also have the ability through the extension of a Memento meta aggregator over Memgator to be able to specify what set of archives are used um, for the aggregation process and many other things that are covered in that paper, which we don't necessarily have time to go in here, but if you're interested in it, then um, these slides will be posted in this recording available for you to reference and um, look further into. So as sort of a practical example here, um, assuming we have all these tools and this, Al this is Alice here and she has been preserving things, um, what you see on CNN.com because she sees a story evolving and thinks it's important or whatever site she feels that uh, maybe rapidly changing and is important to preserve. And then she has her own captures that she doesn't necessarily want to uh, share with everyone, but she wants to ensure that she has it in the future. Um, so Alice says, I see something on CNN or I see something on my local newspaper that I don't think the archives are actually getting. Um, so I want to see my capture temporarily in line with the captures from inner archive and only inner archive, not necessarily the other, many other archives in there because we, she may not necessarily trust the other archives. So she wants her captures and inner archives captures and that's it. So her idea is to have all her captures and then her, her one unique capture to be able to, um, uh, her one unique capture to be able to uh, see it, uh, see the part of the story that's evolved. Um, so she, she's able through uh, the introduction of this framework to spin up her own meta aggregator and see the same sort of thing. She can then configure this aggregator, say, look at my CNN captures and also in our archives captures and the aggregator itself will do the legwork of uh, querying the different, archives here, so those two archives, and then temporarily aggregating them, making them sort of queryable and shareable to anyone that wants to see the combination of uh, Alice and inner archives pictures of CNN of the past. Um, so part of this uh, power is also, she can say to Carol, uh, Carol, you wanna see what, uh, what I see of CNN plus what inner archives sees, because I think I have a unique capture of the past and she can query it all the same because it's essentially a web service. Um, and she gets back the same thing that Alice would get, but then Carol has her own idea. She wants to supplement those captures of Alice and Alice's in inner archives and include that in, um, in the temporal pictures as well. She feels that she's getting perspect different perspective. So if you ever visited a website from different locations, you may see that you get a different representation based on, it, 
based on what uh, where your location is. Or if, for example, your country restricts what you see, and you want to record what that actually is, that is an important perspective on what the web as it was, because it is a true representation. So here, Carol wants to say, I have I see a representation of the same site that you're aggregating together with you two, two, two cap, your two captures. And so she can very easily spin up her own meta aggregator and say, I want to include my capture and then everything that comes from Alice's meta aggregator. What she may not even know it comes from Alice's meta aggregator, but she can say, I'm going to take everything that comes from there and supplement it with what I have on mine. And when she queries it, then she, for CNN, she gets her own captures here, two set individual captures that are uh, unique to um, her own archive. Um, so her A aggregation. Um, but this isn't necessarily um, applicable to uh, sites where Alice, for example, wants to protect her capture. So if here, uh, Malcolm, we're calling the guy in the right, says, um, get me um, all the Bank of America captures from uh, just Alice's archive, since we're enabling that power on there, then Alice may be a little worried that she's exposing everything. So the problem isn't solved by simply saying we allow uh, individuals to specify what the archival sources are. And so from this, we introduced the, um, what we call the private web archive adapter, which we used um, conventional web standards like um, OAuth 2 uh, and used uh, the concept of having an entity that's separate to um, the archive itself that allows for this standard authentication me mechanism and a tokenization mechanism, which we'll see here with the power in that, um, to not only um, decouple the archive from having this role of managing um, authentication of private web archives, in this case, your own machine, um, but to allow the archives to be functionally cohesive and allow the authentication mechanism to be functionally cohesive and make it where these different tools that we're developing and these concepts we're developing are interoperable, interoperable with other standards and applicable elsewhere. Um, and so in the same regard, uh, if uh, evil Bob here and Malcolm were to query uh, Alice's meta aggregator, instead of simply giving access to it because they know the URI uh, of the capture itself, the um, archive will say you need to first authenticate through this other mechanism before we're going to give you access to it. So um, where you would normally see uh, what differentiates um, facebook.com with that logged in or not um, is a similar procedure that uses OAuth2 uh, on the back end, where if you go there, you don't have login credentials. It says provide us login credentials and you'll get a different representation. So it's the same sort of live web mechanism uh, mechanisms, but applied to the archive web. Um, so to explain OAuth uh, 2 a little more, um, and really this is just the concept of standard authentication mechanisms, is you have this concept of a tokenization where after you log in, you get a, a, a key, uh, sort of a hash value that allows you to use that for subsequent uh, login. So you don't have to provide those credentials each and every time. And so through reusing this key, you defer to the authentic authentication mechanism to um, check whether that key is still valid in the future without having to supply uh, the credentials to many different services. So if you've ever like uh, used your identity on a blog to comment, um, you would log in through Facebook and Facebook would return a, uh, a, a key back to the blog to say use this to associate the identity with the user that's posting. And so every time you posted on the, um, every time you post in the blog, it would use that same thing. But then if your credentials got, uh, got hacked, that key could be revoked and then you wouldn't necessarily have to um, you wouldn't have to reset your credentials. Or for example, uh, if uh, you want to uh, say someone else you know is using your thing, you can revoke it. And then another key would be have to re be reg re registered and you would have to provide the original credentials to obtain another key to do it. So applying these concepts in the live web of authentication are useful, standardized, and make it so this framework's a little more interoperable uh, between existing tools. Um, so in the same regard, once you've authenticated through the standard process of OAuth2, um, we can also share these tokens. For example, if Alice is providing, uh, it logs in and has this key, can, she can share this key, whatever thing, with her friend here, Carol, say, use this for access in the future. And if uh, Bob wants to log in, but he should only have certain access, uh, OAuth2 has this concept of scoping, where uh, Alice can specify if you are logging in using this different role, then you will get a different sort of key that, uh, that signifies that uh, that you have to access to different things. So for example, if Alice wanted to enable access to all her CNN captures, but not to her Bank of America captures, then um, she would be able to do so through the standard mechanism. And then if someone like uh, Malcolm here on the right um, oh, just provides a random key, he won't get access because he has to go through it. So this concept of OAuth2 and tokenization allows these keys to be shared between Alice and Carol, as we see, uh, keys to be disavowed if credentials are compromised, um, and then uh, it allows you to limit scope as we see here if you want to regulate um, what is uh, enabled by that. Um, 
So all these keys would then be subsequently passed and then access uh, uh, enabled or not enabled through um, the subsequent um, validation of the keys that are provided. Um, so um, we, uh, through, through this, uh, sort of an extension of this work is to be able to, if we're going to aggregate private and public web archives, we want to be able to do negotiation in dimensions beyond time. So while Memento introduced this concept of time where we can associate what a capture of the past is and what time in, in the past it represents, and another citation I should have included in there, um, uh, we want to be able to do the, uh, uh, we want to be able to do the negotiation in dimensions like uh, whether a capture, whether an archive is public or private. If we have um, things like Alice has two different um, archives, their own machine, we want to be able to um, disambiguate which captures are allowed and which aren't, um, as well as other dimensions. Like for example, if we um, have a uh, capture quality that varies across many different archives. So if you've ever used web archives before, um, depending on who's doing the web archiving itself, which institution, um, the quality is vastly different. And we've done numerous studies on this to show that um, you may only want to look to certain archives to do it. But if you're doing it from the um, aggregation perspective, then you have to mainly go through and be able to see what the source is to be able to uh, clear out the ones that you may not necessarily want to see. So having a more systematic way to do that is powerful. If you're able to do negotiating on the dimension of uh, quality or any other thing that requires you to actually look at the capture itself to evaluate it. Um, and then uh, as we saw for, for one of our rec recent studies, which is not cited here, unfortunately, uh, many of the archive, archival captures of some sites, especially bigger sites, are redirects in time. So through uh, a very lengthy uh, tech report, we found that about 80% of the google.com captures in the past are actually redirects. So if we're trying to evaluate um, how well archive a, uh, a URI is in the past, um, simply through quantity of looking at these time maps, um, you can't necessarily uh, uh, accurately evaluate it. You have to actually look at the capture itself to see if it's not a redirect. And so having things like surfacing up uh, traits that are uh, inherent in the capture itself without having to do analysis on it. So by just dereferencing the URI, the URIM of the past, um, we can say, oh, this is a redirect. So it's likely not useful to what we have. And so from there, we can pare it down to the things we want. So having these different dimensions that we can um, do negotiation on beyond simply time is uh, very powerful. And we started investigating this with, um, through my uh, dissertation work and there's still a lot of open ends here. So we introduced the third um, concept here of a stargate. So star being, um, if you think of a, uh, the gate being the way to do negotiating time. So Memento introduces the time gate. So a stargate, a star being an asterisk here, a wild card of being able to do negotiation dimensions beyond time. So one of the powerful aspects of this is allows you to filter the concept, the content that's returned to you on the server side. So if you, are able to express that you only want the captures that meet a certain criteria, like are a certain quality or are, are a certain language or um, aren't redirects. You can do so through this additional momentity or what we call the momentity in this, which is explained a little more in that paper. Um, if you wanna specify only use um, certain sources here. So even though an, arc, an aggregator, uh, a meta aggregator is, is uh, uh, defined to use a certain set of sources, but you only want a certain set of cat sources, and you want to include your own in temporal picture, as we saw before. A Stargate kind of allows you to do this sort of thing. Um, and some, one of the powerful things here is also uh, through a standard, through an RFC uh, specifying uh, uh, standard way to express this sort of thing using the preferred HTTP header, which we won't go into here. It's a little technical. Um, you can, the aggregator itself doesn't need not comply to these requests. So you're specifying preference whether the web service um, complies with this is up to this, how the service implements it. Um, but it also allows that, um, allows the client itself and not the person running the web service to express these preferences. So normally you can spin up your own instance of, uh, of a meta aggregator, but you're still, if your words are shared with other people without them spinning up their own, they are still at the mercy of someone else saying, what is the use of the source? What is the implementation here? So enabling uh, client side preference is real powerful here because for the most part you're glad that you got what you got and um, you don't have a lot of control over specifying it beyond that. Um, and so we introduced these concepts of doing archival negotiation beyond time through the Stargate uh, uh, concept and we detail a little more in the papers. Um, so if, as a quick example here, so say Bob here wants to say give me only archives in the past um, despite what you have um, that are uh, that are private. So we say private only here in the case. This case. And there are standard ways to express this through the syntax of the, um, of the HTTP header itself. So Bob specifies this and the aggregator in the second step says, um, here is, uh, here's all the archives I have. Uh, first filter this and tell me which ones are private. 
And once it does that, the Stargate can then say, okay, these two are private, these two, two archives. And only then we uh, will query those two uh, archives. So for instance, if you are um, searching for something that you don't want to want the archives to necessarily know you're searching for in the past, um, this is powerful. You can say, I only want to search for uh, within uh, domestic archives that we know of. Or if you're, um, if you know that someone's uh, manipulating the story in some way, then you only want to spe specify uh, the archives that are reliable sources for it so you don't get misinformation. Um, and you also want to, don't want to expose that you're looking to, at these, to these archives because then they'll know that they are actually relevant in the story. Um, and so the second part here that we talked about before, so if you have uh, a lot of different redundant captures as we saw with the Google example here, we see on the right of apple.com in the past is if you look at all the captures of apple.com in the past, you see a lot of redundancy of when they introduced a new product. And if you look at the web archives, because the pages aren't exactly identical, they saw these as unique captures. And so if you were to generate screenshots of all these in the past, you would see this uh, very large level of redundancy in this. So being able to pare this down to get the captures, to get a good summary of how the page exists in the past is very useful to kind of uh, evaluate it beyond simply um, the number of captures you have, which we, we saw before is uh, fallacious. Um, so one way to do this, which is a completely different work, but it's relevant here is you're able to look at the HTML, generate this, what we call a SIM hash. And the SIM hash is sort of the signature that instead of conventional hashing mechanisms, uh, varies only slightly when things are similar. So in normal hashing mechanisms, when things are even slightly dissimilar, um, they uh, vary greatly, where it's very distinct from one another. Uh, SIM hash compared to that, um, when things vary slightly, um, the hash itself is slightly, slightly dissimilar. So as we see between the, the second and third example here, there is only what we, they call a hamming distance of one. So because it only has that subtle change, it wouldn't be significant enough to say this is a very unique capture. Um, but when we see the one on the bottom, we know that something drastic changed on the page and we should probably capture that. So that threshold was uh, studied uh, by Al Sam in ECIR 2014, I believe, uh, that defined this threshold of how, how different does a page actually have to be in the past before it's significant enough to be included in a summary of the past. Um, so, and this threshold here, we saw what we call a hamming distance of four. So if you just meet this threshold, it's included in the summarization and this work's been um, published and is available. Um, but we use this dissimilarity through analysis of the HTML page itself and not any other subsequent resources. So it's not hugely expensive to first define what we want to say is included in the summary um, and then go through the expensive procedure of generating the screenshots for it if we want to see it uh, pictorially in the past. So being able to do this negotiation uh, in dimensions of the, uh, of the similar similarity, we can say, okay, we want only the captures that are um, under the certain threshold of quality, so above the threshold and quality, so that here we have the damage measure, MD is damage, and that they are unique captures, and we want to be able to specify this. But unlike before, um, we can't say there's a filtering procedure. We have to look at the captures itself before we can do it. So first we, um, uh, first, we, uh, first we query all these archives, we get all the HTML of them, and we specify uh, these different hashes that we've generated from them to a Stargate. The Stargate can then say, okay, these are the ones that meet this threshold, go ahead and use these as a basis for what to include in the aggregation, meeting the criteria that the, the user originally specified of being under a damage threshold and being unique. So we have a lot of power here, both content-based attributes of things that require you to look at the capture itself to do some analysis for it, which may be a long learning process, um, and then derived attributes of saying, okay, we have, um, uh, sorry, the attributes that, that require processing versus the content-based attribute is one where, for example, it is, uh, has like a HP 300 or 200, depending on if you want to exclude the redirect. Um, so kind of in, in summation, um, this talk uh, was about saving your, your web things for you. So preserving content behind authentication, which we covered, and others through collaboration, we're able to do this through um, being able to enable uh, individuals to deploy their own aggregators and doing so through a query mechanism that enables the client to, um, to query these aggregators. Um, and then be able to regulate access through access control. And we covered a couple other things that are relevant and there's still a lot of um, open-ended work here. Um, some of these open-ended research efforts as we didn't discuss here include um, doing uh, the querying very efficiently. So um, it is very temporally, computationally, and spatially expensive to be able to do the analysis of many different archives, which are for the most part monotonically increasing in size, so it's getting even more expensive uh, in the future. So being able to do so efficiently is something that is definitely a consideration of ours. Um, making the software easy to use, self-hosted um, and native, so those that are preserving the web um, aren't necessarily tech-savvy people, so we want to make 
sure that they can use these tools and not have to go to the command line to be able to interact with them. We also, if you're saving all these things on your own machine, we want to be able to enable you to distribute these in a very safe manner um, to encourage the resilience of the archive. So if these things are actually important and you're saving them, you don't want your hard drive dying to make all your efforts move in the, in the future. So um, previous, some of our previous work with Interplanetary Wayback, which uh, is an open source uh, package that we developed uh, during my dissertation to, um, to encourage this sort of thing. Um, and then um, in our initial work, we simply went through off too, but there's likely other more systematic mechanisms to regulate access to web archives. Um, and so there's more research uh, to be done on that to make it so it's a little more systematic and easy for individuals to um, understand. Um, and so that is the end of uh, this talk and I'll take any questions. Um, and you can type questions um, if you want, or you can say them. Chat here. Okay, so um, yeah, and uh, we, we did have one question, which you said it was answered here. So I can go on to a little more. What's the granularity of access control? Can contributors specify a list of access by capture or by site set of captures? So our initial work of simply introducing um, access control to private web archives was novel in and of itself. Um, and so there's still a lot of open-endedness with this. So the way we did it, uh, we specified the level of granularity set up by you. So what um, determines whether an archive is private or public is how you specify it. So when you're setting up these captures, if you have multiple cap archives or multiple collections or multiple other um, uh, uh, qualitative attributes you want associated with it. So say you have collection and it's only about a certain topic, you can include that as a basis for um, what is of that topic or not. So in this, we specified the two topics of being public and private, but uh, the label that you associate with those two classes is really up to you with this uh, initial implementation. Hey, Matt, this is Justin. Um, so you, you touched a little bit on the challenges of uh, archiving things behind login walls. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how you address that with some of your tools? Uh, sure, Justin. Okay, so, um, and this actually uh, bridges off of Justin was a previous collaborator of mine, but he, um, some of his work that was separate from mine, and we talked about this a little bit, was the considerations of content that is preserved behind all the authentication that um, in his instance was on a corporate intranet where the information couldn't be exposed. And he had to basically essentially um, wipe out all the captures because it contains sensitive information. So um, some of the uh, tools I developed um, use the representation itself rather than URI. Um, so as we saw uh, earlier in this presentation, we have where conventional web archives uh, preserve the content by URI itself. Um, instead, these tools, for example, the browser-based tool WorkCreate, which we developed, um, takes a representation that you're seeing in your browser and preserves that to the standard work format to make it interoperable with the other tools. So if you have these captures of your representations in the past, um, you have the actual representation of what you saw. The Archive What I See Now project was about taking what you see in your browser and saving that for the future rather than saying, go to this location and see what's there. And hopefully it is what I see now. So hopefully that answers the question, Justin. Yeah, it works for me. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, if you have any questions in the future, um, this is uh, being recorded in my contact information website or here for more information. If there's anything that is of interest to you, there's a lot of open ends on this and um, I'm open to discuss it, uh, any of them in the future because it is um, research I'm currently pursuing. So um, thank you for your time and um, joining us here for this talk and um, hope to hear from you in the future. <laughs>